All right, guys and girls, this is Jerningham here. The coronavirus numbers to date in the UK have gone up to 39,237 people have died with the new variant, I think. So I'm going to be looking at everything else and what's been happening of the numbers and stuff. Increased COVID-19 last week, 57%, uh, 1,909 arranged hospital admissions per day, currently in hospital, 20,917 people, which COVID-19. So this is a different supplement, or how you could say it, so you can see there. There's always different things about things and stuff. Merry Christmas to everybody. Christmas is tomorrow, Christmas Eve is today. So we're going to be moving on from that. And the R number is this, 1.13 running range. So I don't, I'm trying to figure out the other coronavirus numbers, but I don't think they're on yet. So I'm going through the video. It's talking about health secondary veteran uh, uh, COVID-19. That is in South Africa. So this is a bit of South Africa. People are cooking food there in South Africa. We, need, no one, we all need to survive to eat. I need to get some food in a minute. I'm very hungry. I've been out to the uh, shops in real life to get some stuff. Um, so there's nothing much there of that. It's talking about lorries jamming. As you can see here, woman's there talking about the uh, around 50 lorries stuck in Dover, set in the UK, Fort Channel. Uh, the tunnel of France this morning, she's saying there. Moving through that, it's talking about Donald Trump coming off a plane. Irish resigned minister uh, says the expectancy of gross Brexit deal agreement. There's just so much news to go through today. Boris Johnson is trying to get a deal with the European Union, as you can see there. And there's one there. But it's like going in limbo. Will we ever get a deal? Will we trade with other countries? Hard to say, really, but uh, we just have to wait and see. I'm trying to find what I've ever... I was going to pass something here. Darn it. Went too far ahead. Right, there we go. Two seconds, guys and girls. I'm just trying to find what I'm looking for. It's like looking for a... Uh... Right, what am I doing here? I've got to go for the whole channel again to see what's going on. Nope, I'm still trying to find the numbers for today, but there have been problems. It's not really showing much on the news, as we all know. But apart from what I've just said on the news, um, I've just got to try and find the numbers. Let's talk about a trade agreement for Brexit, uh, which is not the government's problem per end. What is that supposed to mean? All sorts of words on here. All I want is the coronavirus numbers, but I can't seem to... Let's talk about fish, fishermen's older nations saying they will be battery point disappointment. There is no more on the break from the UK, from the current rules. The Department of Health says uh, there was a lot of people 600,016 people have received uh, the, the vaccine down the street says the UK uh, EU would agree and a post Brexit trade deal which says <coughs> how about that protecting the market goods on Friday agreement with a delivery of everything a comprehensive Canada style free trade deal yes. between the UK and the EU which achieves something that the people of this country instinctively knew was doable which they were told was impossible. We've taken back control of our laws and so trading with Canada, I think you're saying control of every jot and tittle of our regulation in a way that is complete 
and unfettered. From January the 1st, we are outside the customs union and outside the single market. British laws will be made solely by the British Parliament, interpreted by UK judge judges sitting in UK courts, and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice will come to an end. For the first time since 1973, we will be an independent coastal state with full control of our waters. And I want to stress that uh, although, of course, uh, the, the arguments with our European friends and partners were, uh, were sometimes uh, fierce, this, this is, I believe, a good deal for the whole of, uh, of Europe. I think this deal means a new stability and a new uh, certainty in what has sometimes been a fractious and difficult relationship. We will be your friend, your ally, your supporter, <coughs> never let it be forgotten, your number one market. Because although we have left the EU, this country will remain culturally, emotionally, historically, strategically, geologically attached to Europe. Long-term benefits, argues the Prime Minister, but could there be short-term challenges? Prime Minister, you say this is an unprecedented deal that reserves all your red lines and promises to the country and people of trust that life will be better as a result of this deal and that there won't be any disruption even in the short term. Well, uh, Sam, I mean, really good, really good questions. I mean, short term, there are things we have to get right, process that, for the processes that maybe people have to... To, to do that they need to be aware of, and I'm going to assume that point really is worth uh, reinforcing. I do believe that the freedoms that this treaty wins us, basically uh, a, a new independence from uh, the EU, are, are worth having. I would say it's one thing to get freedom. Winning freedom is a fantastic thing, and, and that, this is an important element of what we've done. But it's how we use it, how we make the most of it. Uh, that's what's going to matter in the in the in the months and, and years to come. The Prime Minister has taken the country on a Brexit roller coaster over the last few weeks with hope and standoffs and rows. Ultimately what he presents as a Christmas Eve negotiating coup. But today isn't about him, it's about the voters and whether or not people who voted to leave in June 2016 are happy with what the Prime Minister ended up agreeing. Are there sufficient freedoms to do things outside of the EU as they hoped? or not? Will businesses face disruption, or will the risks be sensibly managed? Only when the 500-page legal agreement actually comes into force in a week's time will we start to know the answer to those questions. Labour don't like the deal, but nevertheless will vote for it. When this deal comes before Parliament, Labour will accept it and vote for it. But let me be absolutely clear and say directly to the government, up against no deal, we accept this deal, but the consequences of it are yours, and yours alone, and we will hold you to account for it, every second you're in power. Fears over the Northern Ireland border mean that the nation is now in a completely new and unprecedented arrangement. The First Minister explains how. Now we're in the single market for goods in terms of the European Union, we're in the United Kingdom's customs uh, code, so we are, are in both, if you like, so that gives us a, a difference, but yet we do, represent, we do of course, uh, recognise the UK sovereignty for us here in Northern Ireland. If this other architect of the referendum vote doesn't object to the deal, that suggests a Brexiteer revolt is nothing to fear. And if we take the big picture, you know, and don't forget, I've been campaigning for us to leave for 30 years, uh, and this is, may not be perfect, but it's a very, very big day and a big step forward. Boris Johnson celebrating a win for both sides, but even he doesn't know what this deal will actually do in practice when it comes into force. Luckily, there's not long to wait until January the 1st. Sam Coates, Sky News. Well, that'd be good then. It's Christmas recess on the first. Canada deal then. Across Europe, ratifying the trade deal isn't as straightforward. The government 
citizens of the 27 member states should be able to give their approval remotely, but the European Parliament will not reconvene before the end of the year. MEPs are now expected to be asked to sign off the treaty retrospectively in 2021. Our Europe correspondent, Sir Adam Parsons, reports. There was pride, but little sense of triumph in Brussels today. Brexit has bruised and saddened the European Union. A deal is a balm, but not a cure. To our friends in the United Kingdom, I want to say, parting is such sweet sorrow. <laughs> but to use a line from T.S. Eliot, what we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. We are one of the giants. Alongside her, the man who spent years <coughs> negotiating on the EU's behalf. The clock is no longer ticking. After four years of collective effort and EU unity to preserve peace and stability on the island of Ireland, to protect the citizens and the civil market, to build a new partnership with the UK. After the frenzy of activity, a sense of calm over Brussels tonight. The EU will now push through its ratification process. Mr Barnier will spend his Christmas morning briefing. <coughs> For years, leaders, politicians, That's officials off, and negotiators have come here to the European Commission to try to shape a Brexit deal. We've had rows, genuine animosity and so many missed deadlines. But now the feeling in Brussels is a blend of relief mm. about the agreement, but also lingering regret that the UK really is leaving the club. For all involved, the challenge now is to move on from the tensions of Brexit and to make this new relationship a success. From our perspective, it's a triumph in the Irish position in terms of holding the line on key issues of the all island economy, but clearly in terms of being at the heart of Europe, protecting the single market, our place in the single market, uh, but above all, protecting uh, the, the bread and butter, if you like, of Irish industry in terms of the small to medium-sized companies who do export a lot uh, to the UK. There are still hurdles to cross, but few now doubt this deal will be in place come January the 1st. In this, the city of politics, the deal feels done. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Brussels. And we'll speak to Adam in just a moment, but first to Joe Pike in Westminster for us. And Joe, it's a case of, I suppose, a picture paints a thousand words. That photograph released by the Prime Minister this afternoon, really expressing the jubilation, I suppose, at number 10 tonight. Yeah, he, that was uh, during a video conference, as about, with Ursula von der Leyen, the fifth time he'd spoken to the EU Commission president in uh, 24 hours. And that was the moment they realised that all of the I's had been uh, dotted and the T's had been crossed. Clearly a great moment of uh, personal uh, victory for Boris Johnson. But in the press conference, we saw both uh, leaders, both leaders either on either side of this a negotiating battle, uh, really get across a tone of relief. Boris Johnson did seem relieved, and, and neither side got tempted by the idea of being too <coughs> triumphant. It was interesting to hear Ursula von der Leyen with yeah. the Beatles, Shakespeare, <coughs> and T.S. Eliot, and uh, so Mr. Up. Johnson saying that the UK will remain attached to the EU culturally, emotionally, historically, strategically, geologically. Boris Johnson knows that this is a, a personal victory for him. His decision uh, nearly five years ago to uh, back Brexit in the EU referendum campaign was controversial. He said he had to really uh, think about making that decision. Agonise was the word uh, he used. And of course, uh, his role in that campaign uh, was uh, you know, transformative and also transformative to his career. The last five years have been difficult uh, for Boris Johnson, difficult for his party, but he has managed to achieve something that Theresa May did not and solve the Brexit conundrum, the be Brexit puzzle, and the fish pattern we saw on his tie tonight is maybe a sign of the last riddle in that uh, that, that puzzle, the riddle over uh, fish and fish quotas. I think Boris Johnson will be pleased tonight that there don't seem to be too many people who are angry at the deal. No one is calling, uh, c calling him a sellout, saying that he has conceded too far, and indeed Nigel Farage saying it's not perfect, but not being... Uh, too negative. I think he will be relieved about that, but he knows what happens in the coming months and coming years is the is real uh, sign of 
of how good this deal is. And no one really knows at this stage what effect it will have. Okay, Joe, thank you to Adam then in Brussels. And throughout this whole process, Adam, there's been so many analogies, haven't there? Lots of references to this being like striking out the terms of the divorce. And I suppose in this, you could say the Europeans are the sort of more heartbroken party, certainly in the language they struck today at that news conference. Yeah, look, nobody in the European Union management wanted Brexit. You talk to just about anybody in this city and they think it's a bad idea. Obviously, they buy into the idea uh, of the big EU and it's gone from 28 countries to 27. And in the process, it's lost a very significant, wealthy, influential player. So, yes, they are sad. Ursula von der Leyen was, I think, quite pointedly uh, downbeat and muted uh, in her comments today. There is no sense here of that kind of triumphalism and one diplomat said to me tonight that they think that uh, uh, Boris Johnson is allowed to take the acclaim they said look he, he can have the spectacle uh, we don't really need it at the moment what they did need they felt was a big significant deal particularly around fishing that's why it went up to the last minute and one of the reasons is that Emmanuel Macron the French president was really seen as the one person who at the late stages might be tempted to use a veto. And I think that's why here in Brussels there is relief, that they think they got a pretty good deal uh, around fish, that they uh, persuaded the UK to come much more uh, towards their position uh, than they had perhaps uh, expected. But what happens next? Well, there's going to be a meeting of uh, EU ambassadors tomorrow morning where they will be briefed in person by Michelle Barnier, that is how they will be spending their Christmas morning. Uh, and then we head towards ratification that will come into place uh, on January the 1st. I don't frankly see any hiccups on that. Mr Macron tweeted his approval of this deal. I think that is uh, the final hurdle. The European Parliament, yes, it will uh, discuss this. Yes, it will be asked to give retrospective approval. And yes, I am 99.99% sure that that is exactly uh, what they will do. And I think uh, one of the questions now is about how they move on. There was animosity, there were fierce words, and this has been a year sort of bruised that relationship. Everybody now wants to put it behind them and start acting in a different way, forming a different sort of relationship. Absolutely. OK, Adam and Joe, thank you both very much indeed. Well, the European Union is the world's biggest trading bloc, and so the biggest impact of the deal will, of course, be economic rather than political. Businesses have been waiting for certainty for months, if not years, but there are hundreds of pages of detail to be studied before the real impact will be known. Sky's economics editor Ed Conway has been analysing the official document. We have a deal, which means lots of small print. It's just starting to come through now, all of the text. And let's just have a look at what we're learning so far. It's going to take days to get through this stuff. But initially, let's have a look at the headlines. And this comes from the UK documentation, so released by Downing Street. Uh, and it shows you the main highlight of this, perhaps, uh, is no tariffs or quotas on the movement of goods. Tariff-free, quota-free, it's not quite the same as free trade because there are still non-tariff uh, barriers, lots of form-filling. But nonetheless, that is the big thing, a big part of this deal. Uh, as is this, in political terms at least, UK sovereignty over our fishing waters. Fishing became a big thing. It Basically, this means the EU is going to reduce the quotas uh, that EU vessels can get, and the UK gets back more of that in the coming years. Uh, this isn't the only stuff. There's plenty more, including, for instance, the UK is going to stay in certain EU programmes, uh, particularly uh, scientific collaboration through Horizon, but not Erasmus. So student exchange, uh, that won't be re retained. And it's also worth uh, just underlining, in a way, the most important institution that comes of this is called the Partnership Council. Now, remember that level playing field thing? It was all about ensuring that the UK wouldn't be able to reduce its regulations when it came to en environmental labour standards. Well, we know that there's going to be this Partnership Council, which is going to kind of adjudicate whether it is keeping to that and whether to impose tariffs. That's going to be really important in the next few years. I should say, it's not just the UK which has released documents. We've also got stuff uh, from the European Commission as well. And it paints a very different picture. It's kind of interesting here. It's not talking about what the UK gains, but what it loses. So the free movement of persons will end. The free movement of goods will end. Services too, 
And if you flick through this, <clears throat> it is just striking <clears throat> yep. how much of a different picture uh, it paints. So, for instance, just skimming through here, one thing the city wanted to retain or wanted to get was some sort of a good <clears throat> financial <clears throat> 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 so throat> they could do more trading in the EU. That hasn't come through. Uh, and EU underlining passporting uh, rights for financial services don't survive in this deal. And have a look at this. This document was uh, designed, I suppose, to try to discourage other EU members from leaving, showing you on the right-hand side all those ticks, what you get in the EU, and on the left-hand side all those crosses, what you get with this new deal, what the UK gets, basically. A lot of crosses on various different things, like pet passports, or indeed visa-free free travel beyond 90 days. But put it all together, and what do we have economically? Well, let's just kind of have a look at this kind of assessment from the OBR, the Office Budget Responsibility. Now, that flat line is basically the equivalent of if we'd stayed inside the EU. Now, with a deal, that's kind of where we are at the moment, with a deal, you would be talking, probably the OBR, about potentially an economy that was 4% smaller in the long run. Compare that to no deal, about 6%. Smaller. So clearly we're in a better position, but the key thing really is the gap between those two lines is, and staying inside the EU is far bigger than between a free trade deal and no deal. So everyone's relieved, but nonetheless, it will potentially, according to economists, mean a smaller economy in the future. Critical moment thinking there. Well, a Brexit deal ensures that champagne, among other things, will still be available tariff-free come January the 1st. But don't expect many in business to be popping corks because the agreement between the UK and the EU says there will be non-tariff barriers to trade, such as customs declarations and border checks, but it averts the very worst outcome of a no-deal Brexit for British businesses. Sky's business correspondent Paul Kelsey has the details. For four and a half years, businesses waited to discover what Brexit would mean. From manufacturing to the city, pharmaceuticals to food. They're about to find out if a deal they were desperate to see signed brings new opportunities or damage limitation. Britain's decision to follow its own path <coughs> could have been disastrous for farmers like Matt. No deal would have meant tariffs on his lamb that would have put his Gloucestershire farm out of business. I think I speak for all seed farmers, a huge sigh of relief today. Um, and although there will be some uh, problems and, and extra paperwork and a, a little bit of cost involved, um, we can get on with, with what we do, um, exporting lambs and uh, carry on producing. Among major employers, there was little enthusiasm for Brexit, but consensus that a deal, any deal, is better than none. The headline of, of no tariffs is, is good news for, for consumers in this country because four-fifths of the food that we import comes from the EU and if we'd had tariffs that would have been meant extra costs for consumers. But the devil is in the detail. For months, agreement floundered on fishing, an industry worth 0.1% of GDP but with far greater symbolic value. The deal means EU boats will take 25% less fish from British waters in five years. In the meantime, there'll be direct support for fishing communities. But for Alan, who's fished the waters of North Shields for 50 years, the deal isn't good enough. Definitely not. I think the majority would be the same. Nice to have some sort of deal, but that long, and uh, if you want to give us that percentage, it's very poor. There was relief in the car industry. With Nissan welcoming the deal, having warned no deal threatened the viability of its UK operations. But while tariffs are no longer a threat, this deal uniquely has focused on erecting barriers to trade expected to add cost and delays. The chaos in Dover in recent days, a foretaste of disruption the government has warned business to expect. In eight days' time, hauliers won't just need COVID checks to get on these ferries. They'll need to make customs declarations for everything they're carrying. They'll face security and regulatory checks, and they'll need a permit to get into Kent in the first place. All new red tape as a consequence of Britain leaving the customs union and the single market. And for some, Brexit has only just started. Financial services worth almost 200 times more than fishing are not part of the deal. And there'll be a new customs border in the Irish Sea to negotiate. At times in this tortuous process, business has wondered if politics would trump prosperity. It will now try to make the deal deliver on both. Paul Kelso, Sky News in Dover. 
Well, in case you missed it a little bit earlier this afternoon, that historic speech from the Prime Minister, we will be replaying that in full at half past this hour right here on Sky News. To COVID now, and the UK has recorded its second highest daily number of coronavirus cases since the start of the pandemic. <coughs> Another 570 yep. people have died after testing positive for coronavirus, and 39,036 more cases have been recorded. There are now 21,286 patients in hospital, just a few hundred of the peak. Wow. How do you feel just being this report? Up and down the country, Christmas is different. What are we going to do with these? For the people staying at home. Hi, Merry Christmas, everyone. And those planning a quiet Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> In Tier 2, Oxfordshire, Tier 4 awaits. Tomorrow, people can still form a Christmas bubble. On Boxing Day, they'll be told to stay at home. Any English tulip today, three pound of lunch. Richard's flower shop will have to stay closed. We bought a lot of tulip bulbs in to grow for Christmas, hoping there will be no lockdown. Um, this will cause problems. We've still got them left to sell. So what else do we do? But as the government tries to save lives first, the pandemic curve is climbing. And the number of people testing positive in England rose by 58%, according to the latest test and trace figures. Separate statistics show that on the week starting the 12th of December, around one in 85 had COVID in England, compared to one in 95 the previous week. In Northern Ireland, it was one in 180. In Scotland, one in 140. In Wales, there was a steep rise with one in 60 estimated to have COVID-19. I think we've got more inpatients now than at the peak of the first wave, and that, that shows so no sign of letting up at all, and actually the case rate around here is rising. This is a, a degree of business that none of us have ever seen before, really. Um, and, you know, what with the hospital getting increasingly full of patients with COVID, you know, it's only a matter of time, really, before we, we go over our capacity. Right now, we see still... And with warnings, a new variant could account for half of UK cases. Christmas won't be all that's lost to COVID. These restrictions were implemented so late, we cannot do really anything for the new years. We will see a peak of, of infections then. Hopefully, the latest March <laughs> will help us to just start going back to something relatively normal. The rise in cases is partly down to more testing. But even a week ago, this is a Christmas few expected. And it's what happens beyond December that matters now. Annie Fortescue, Sky News.